So welcome uh, in this um, episode uh, where are having a guest called Mattia Schuklier. Uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly. It was close enough. You could just close drop the J. Uh, so Mattia Schukle is how you probably oh, okay. pronounce it. But oh, so so now I have the recording, so I can cut out this bit and practice and just. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I do the so, editing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Okay. So, a bit of background. Who are you? Um, yeah. So, as, as, as you said, my, my name's Matthias Schukler. Um, people, uh, some people still call me Hook. That was or still is my nickname online in a lot of places. Um, Usually when I introduce myself to people, I just say I'm a lawyer by profession and a hacker by heart. I think you know me long enough that <laughs> that probably sounds okay, right? <laughs> it depends on how... Uh, you've been a lawyer for a while now. Well, So I think I mean, for every year you become more more of a lawyer. True, yeah. I've been <laughs> more involved with lawyery stuff recently. but But still, I mean, in, in the... It even even now it still happens at the, at work. It still happens like after three years of life. Uh, some people still think that I'm from part of engineering, not a very capable part of engineering, but <laughs> <laughs> it it happens. It happens that people say, "Oh, I thought you're one of the engineers." Yeah, no, I'm the lawyer. <laughs> but you have spent quite a bit in the uh, various communities, have you? Yeah, yeah. It it started way back in I don't know, 96, 97, 98, somewhere around 97 uh when I started uh using Linux in high school. So there was this one box and uh and the uh, um computer part of the library uh which well you know everything else was i think it was windows 95 or maybe already 98 and cool. like really slow machines uh like on dual isdn line so you know loading up your your uh, yahoo mail took like forever so you you know by the time the break was over you could see you had new mail, but then you had to log off. So, you know, little use was that. And, you know, in the middle of it, there was like this black box, uh, you know, black screen, just text, white text on black screen. I was intrigued. So, I, you know, I started playing with that. Or, you know, I asked with somebody who, what's that about? And then they got me access. That's where my nickname comes from. I had to get a user account so i had to have a username to log in and at that time i was uh, uh very much into uh, pirates like real pirates <laughs> and i just recently learned from the encyclopedia britannica that like the physical version like we're still talking about the 90s that was a thing um that captain hook and captain silver were real people and i was that was pretty i found that pretty cool so i just used hook as a nickname and it stuck. So through that, I got into contact with the Linux user group of Slovenia um, and read about, uh, you know, the early open source assays from Stallman and uh, ESR um, and I got interested in the whole community thing because that sounded cool. Um, and through that, I got involved with the Kiberpipa or Cyberpipe hackerspace. Um, had a short stint, I think, like for a year, or was it less? I think for a year, I worked for the Government Center for Informatics on open source and open standards uh, work group. Um, that was in 2003, I think, something around along those lines. And then eventually I got in contact with FSFE and was volunteering. And at some point, Karsten Gerloff, who was then president of FSFE, um, to my big surprise, offered me the position of a paid member uh, so of staff as the legal coordinator of FSFE. And that's the, the short that's the short version of 
the big um the big communities i was involved with and you know then being active in the, whichever distro i currently used um uh active a tiny bit with kd um and things like that you are still in kd aren't you yeah i think i'm part of the ev i'm not sure i think i'm i think i'm an ev member um and yeah just recently we had an again a discussion about licensing but um yeah basically i'm i usually when it comes to licensing and stuff like that i speak my mind and then <laughs> then uh they obviously do what they think is best but uh, it's good to to have you in kde because i mean the whole the situation has been complicated uh, i think it's a lot clearer these days than, than back in the 90s uh oh wow yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> jesus troll the hey yeah that was that was fun times it was it actually it, was it's much more clear now there is no like no problems at all or <laughs> um i mean <sighs> I don't think I'm I'm allowed to comment on this. <laughs> no, I don't, so I don't and also and also I don't know nearly enough to comment on it even if, if even if I thought it would be fair to comment I don't know enough. I'm not involved as much to comment on that. But I mean as a user of of the kit libraries or the the KD frameworks then it's clear. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, yeah, 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 yeah. The complications is is more on other sides. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the, the the the, the con always contentious situation where you have uh, where you have the intersection of community and business, um, and we see that like everywhere. That's you know that's not a KD specific. It's just that KD was maybe one of the first ones uh, where it became apparent. Uh, yeah, we actually have a talk from Aid uh, on right. that topic, so, so we can just link to it up in the corner here. Oh, cool. I, I binged through most of these, so I'm almost at the end, but I'm still of your of your podcast, but I'm still missing a few. Then you have five mm -hmm. years of conference talks. Oh um, so. yeah, no, just the podcast. I mean what what I think I think it just did the last since since it started as a podcast. I didn't do I didn't do all the videos though. So I'm I'm a bit interested in the um, your profession or the, the lawyer. So what did you specialize in? Um, we don't have like an in on on my university in Ljubljana, you know, university. There is no specification, a uh, specialization in uh, when you go, when you go to law school, at least on my faculty. So my specialization literally it says law. Mm -hmm. Um, but in practice, yeah, I specialized in, uh, um, intellectual property law and, and, uh, tiny bit business law. So the thing is we have in the last two years we have, and especially in the South in the last year, uh, you can choose which, uh, uh, courses you want to take. Um, and I took like all of the intellectual property courses that were available um, and uh, some international business uh, courses and stuff like that. Uh, for some reason, which well, I found it, I found it interesting. Also, uh, transport law, That's, that, that kind of interests me. I no capacity to comment on anything, <laughs> yet alone do anything when it comes to uh, transport law, but it's, it, it's an interesting field. <laughs> I know nothing. <laughs> I, at least I know that. Uh, so, what's most fun with being uh, like a lawyer? Um, that's it. That's a, um. I'm gonna spin this one a bit around because, I mean, even the fact that you guys are talking to me means that I'm not, you know, your typical run-of-the-mill lawyer who has a, their own. Uh, law firm and uh, does you know the everything under the sun so i i very much in practice specialize in open source licensing and licensing in general um but what got me into law 
and through the many long years I took to finally finish that study, um, um. Hesse is <laughs> Henrik is laughing because he 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 was vice president when I was still working at FSFE, so he knows how long it took. <laughs> We we try to encourage you quite quite often. <laughs> you did, so, you did. So yeah. so when I left, you finally did it. So I get the point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry for interrupting you. So um, so what got me into it is what I think is interesting is that law is always like has this bi almost bipolar or this complex interaction with the real world where on one hand it has to reflect reality because otherwise as uh, i think yelinek says um, it becomes unlaw and therefore should be abandoned so if law does not reflect the reality it's useless or you know sometimes even worse but on the other hand it also forms it so we see like especially in the modern times um you know, a typical law that we can, like every every one of us feels that is changing the world around us is GDPR. And it's not, it hasn't changed only Europe. I mean, it got exported, the idea got exported across borders to, to other continents as well. So we have, like, this is what I find really interesting about law is because it, on one hand, it codifies uh what the reality is or what reality should be um but at the at the same man it also influences so it's like an interesting balancing act um the other thing why i you know why i always thought i'm not gonna be like like i was i was always always pretty sure or pretty early on during my studies i was pretty sure I'm not going to end up as a typical lawyer, uh, you know, as an advocate with their own office and uh, represent like everything that's under the sun um, is not because I don't like it. I think that's a really interesting challenge, but I feel like if you really want to be good at something, you have to understand the field you're in. So for example, like if you're, if you, if even if you look at for example if you look at an architect you know when you when you get an architect to 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 create something you do expect them to understand basic statics and you know basic physics of how things stand up um and i think the same should apply also to lawyers so when you're when you're getting a lawyer to look into, you know, into your code or your, you know, uh, intellectual property rights of software, they need to understand how software works because otherwise, I mean, you're, you can be just spewing, you know, quoting laws left and right, but that thing doesn't apply. And we come back to the interesting interconnection of law and reality, right? I mean, the, the reality is, or in physics and mathematics is the you know the the law of is, and uh, the world of is, and you know with law you're in the world of should, but you know if should and is is not nearly connected, you get into really weird situations. Cool. Uh, that kind of like relates to the. Uh, <sighs> idea that if you look at a lawyer it's good to have a lawyer who understands the techie part and it's good to have like developers who understand at least some of the developers who understand uh, some of the legal parts yep yep definitely i mean it's it's kind uh, of interesting to to compare the two fields i'd say because my, my experience as, as an engineer is that law is often written if you read law as code it doesn't work <laughs> So, so yeah, you need to no. you need to read law as as a purpose, so to speak. What, what's meant, I mean, which, which to, is to a, sh sometimes challenging as an engineer. It, I, I have a good analogy. It's like you you can read law as it's not a super analogy, but it's 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 at least you know can get you thinking um, in the right direction. It's like you can you can read law as um, you know written law. You can read as source code. 
But the way how it applies in the end is, you know, once you build it, once it gets through the linker and the and uh, uh, and the compiler, and it very much depends on the environment you build it in, you're gonna get a different outcome depending on which machine you build it on. Um, so, so you know, I would say like that's a, a yeah, comparison. It, it makes sense, and I mean, as as then a software engineer, it's it's hard to see the environment because we don't know that field. So I think it's. Yep. Right, that's the tricky bit. That's why I need a lawyer is because they understand the environment and can predict, you know, how the how the linker and the compiler kind of work. Yep. And it's the same with engineers is like, you know, when when you're writing software, you know, most of the time you don't know what the, you know, if if you just write the source code, you don't know what the environment and the and what the linker, especially the linker and then the compiler are going to do. You can predict stuff, but you never know for sure unless, until until you test it out in the in the real world environment. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, what is the biggest difference uh, switching from community uh, to a company? Because you are working as a. Uh, let's go to your profession or your day to day work later. But what's the biggest difference? Um. To the biggest difference, I mean, I think like the first thing that that blew my mind was there's budget. <laughs> 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 but so, so, so for for compare, so for example, like I've I've been working for Liferay for three years. I'm in the position. I'm now in the position of, of almost four now. I'm now in the position of senior counsel. <laughs> Um, and everybody was so surprised when I applied, said, oh, you know, slowly I really need, a, you know, an external monitor for my setup. And everyone was like, what? You don't have an external monitor yet? I was like, yeah, no, I mean, I've, I've used my 13-inch ThinkPad before. I, everything was fine, but now you guys are using this huge table. So, and ah, even on the 14-inch Dell, it's just too big. And, and they were like, but you're, I mean, everybody gets, you know, everybody that works from home gets a monitor right away. It was like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think that was in the budget. It's like, what you crazy? Of course it's in the budget. You need the monitor. <laughs> but on the other hand, I mean, the life is really frugal about its money. So it's not, it's, I haven't flown business class yet. Let's just say like that, even to the America. Um, so we're. But it's interesting, like you get a budget. Um, there's one thing that's, but I, I I find like on the other hand, what I find interesting is like with NGOs, you tend to be, you tend to be, you know, you have to be very nimble when you do things. You know, you have limited resources and you try to squeeze out as much as you can with it. I mean, it's the same in a company, but, you know, we're, you know, in our company, there's like a roughly around 1,000 employees around the world, and it gets really complicated really fast. So it's also like the organization graph is like much more spread out. And then finding the one person that's responsible for the specific thing you need to figure out is sometimes a bit tricky. Um, but on the other hand, what's also kind of useful is because these people are paid to do their job you actually have leverage whereas when you're dealing with you know volunteers you can't force them i mean you can you can try to force them but they're always you know completely uh, free to just go away <laughs> and there's like nothing keeping them other than you know they're just wanting to stay so you need to keep them you know you need other means to keep them happy other than money i mean isn't one of the big difference between an ngo and sort of a, a pro for profit company with a, with a mission that the for an ngo you're trying to squeeze out as much as possible from the money you have to achieve something good while, while for a company you you try to squeeze out as much as possible to actually get more i mean you're, yeah. you're the direction is is towards profits it makes it easier to spend because it's it's an yeah. investment basically 
I mean, it, it's, it's here. Here it is again. Like life is a bit specific, I guess, in this case because we're still um, we're still privately owned by the founders, and that's still that's that there is no plans to change that. Um, so they were not, you know, looking for for a NPO. I no, I was ah. IPO, we're not we're not going public uh, anytime soon or at all. Um, and the other thing is like that because the company started as an like the the the, the company really started as an open source project that was initially intended to be a, a web portal or CMS for the local church. So. <laughs> And then they figured out that it's too complicated for the church to run. <laughs> um, Let's so set up a thousand started... men company instead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they eventually created the company around it. Um, and what they still do, I think, I think um, they donate ten percent or dedicate ten percent of uh, the profits every year. Um, to uh, charities or charitable things, so they even send like we like each each of us employers uh, employees gets uh, forty hours of paid time to work on a charity, uh, and we get a budget I think of five hundred euros to also to den- donate to a charity of our choosing every year. So they're not, of course. Of course, life is a company. Of course, you know the accumulation of money is a, you know, thing, um, and growth and everything. But it's not. It's not as crazy as you know it would be in any startup uh, or um, any privately or publicly owned company, where you need to please the shareholders. So there's no shareholders to please. So. So, how does the day, uh, working day, look like for you? Uh, what is it that you do? <laughs> what is it I do? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm happily, and I hope nobody hears that from the company. I'm happily still in the position where I'm, I'm mostly able to look for my own work. Um, so I'm, you know, my, the title is uh, senior counsel for the IP tracks so for the intellectual property. Um, so on paper, I'm responsible. I mean, I'm, I'm responsible for all intellectual property flowing in and flowing out of the company, um, apart from trademarks. Uh, a colleague of mine, Kirsten Hunyar, is responsible for trademarks. Um, I'm happy to say she's she's doing a great, great job at that, and I haven't done much with trademarks before, so I'm really happy somebody else is dealing with that. Um, so you know, when, because it's code, it may, mo- mostly means uh, copyright and uh, occasionally patents. More in the sense of figuring out what's the best patent protection scheme we can use. Uh, um, so on a day-to-day basis, um, yeah, I I log in, I check my email, I check Jira for any inbound or outbound licensing issues that get assigned to me um, because I am the only one in the um, open source licensing team. So I still have, I still don't have like right now, I don't have anybody else to work with me on that. I still have to do all the scanning of the source code uh, myself and the legal decisions on which, which licenses are okay in which situations and which not. So that's basically it. And so on, when I don't have to scan inbound uh, uh, components or our own outbound uh, products and uh, projects, um, I try to you know tweak things here and there. So recently, we like a few months ago, we we simplified our CLA signing process, which was a joint. Uh, joint project by the developer relations team and me so we worked on that uh, and simplified it so you know things like that you look around see where you can optimize things um, see where you know open up cupboards find skeletons note them down (laughs) 
Um, I'm happy to report that the list is um, getting smaller. <laughs> you know, as you can imagine, for the first year or two, the list was continuously getting longer. You know, when you poke around and you find things. Um, but no shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think both of you can relate to this situation. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. But you actually you actually touched on on two interesting topics there in, in your replies. I mean, we we spoke with Mirko Bem around software panted a while ago, and we've also had uh, Catalina Marake for yep. for CLAs. So, can we dive into one of those? What what was the simplification about, for instance? How how are you working with CLAs? Oh, oh CLAs. I, I, I mean, you might know that's a bit of a path project of mine or pet peeve of mine CLAs um, I I actually wrote my master thesis on the fiduciary license agreement um, and I'm working with Katarina on the current version of the FLA and the contributeragreements.org um, I, I think just as an explanation I think most people of our listeners are, are probably aware of what CLA is but can you describe briefly what an FLA is? Um, FLA is basically a very specific CLA. So it's like you have Apache CLA and you have all sorts of different custom CLAs. So the FLA is a CLA that the FSFE uh, created oh, many years ago. Um, and the big difference is that... Um, the FLA is strikes a really interesting balance where not only are you so on one hand the contributor um, gives an exclusive all, all, all the exclusive rights to their code to uh, the entity to the fiduciary and but on the other hand the fiduciary is obligated by the FLA that. Um, if they're going to use the contribution, it has to be included also in an open source uh, version. So it has to be released under an open source license. Um, it does allow for dual licensing. So it does because you do get exclusive rights. Um, the fiduciary can have a closed source version, but it also needs to be in an open source version. Um, and it also gives back all the rights to the contributor. Um, so obviously non-exclusive rights, but that means that other than, you know, from legal speak, but the mere exclusivity, um, the, um, the contributor doesn't lose any of the rights. Uh, in the code that they contribute. They can do still do with the code that they sent um, whatever they want. They contribute, contribute it to a different project. They can even use it in their own proprietary uh, product if they want to. Um, so that's the main difference between the FLA and most other CLAs out there. It's like this balance between the two. So you make you also make the fiduciary accountable. And the other thing is like there's a safe there's a there are a few safeguards in there. And the biggest one is that um if the fiduciary breaks the trust, um that the FLA automatically uh cancels the um assignment. So the the exclusive rights assignment to the fiduciary. So the contributor automatically gets all the rights back as if nothing happened before. I think I interrupted you uh, asking you to explain FLA and I kind of forgot where we were before that. You were explaining your work with the CLA and FLA at, at your company. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, when it comes to the company... It's because we're a dual licensing or to some extent open core, but the core is like huge, massive. So the, the, the proprietary version is like really, really tiny difference. And, uh, you know, as of a few months ago, or maybe it's also a whole year, but quite a few months ago, um, you can also get the source code to the proprietary version in the same sense as, 
uh, you do with Elastic. So the source code, the, the, the proprietary bits are licensed as a proprietary, as a, under a proprietary license in its own folder, but you get access to the whole source code. Um, but because we have that proprietary component um, and because uh, we do have um, customers that ask for a proprietary uh, license, so they don't want to use the open source version. Um, we have to have the source. Uh, we have to have the copyright assigned to us, or at least have an exclusive right in it. Um, uh, so we did like I didn't create the CLA we are using or the contributor agreement we are using, um, but I just inherited it. Um, I have my own thoughts on it. Privately, <laughs> um, but at least what we could do is we had like a really complicated uh, process of how you sign it. So when you contributed code to our re main repository, there was like you had to create a Jira account on our own server and then create a ticket and then you know check the box that you read the CLA uh, the uh, the contributor agreement in that um, ticket and then open a Git hub pull request refer that ticket so we got rid of the yeah and this really motivated a lot of yes of, of course that was a huge <laughs> motivator right so we got rid of the jira step so we set up a uh, cla assistant bot um and all community contributions can now go directly to the appropriate github repositories and you know the bot will just say okay is ha, has that person already read and signed the you know checked that they signed the contributor agreement yes okay pass if not well you need to do that before you can you know before it gets merged so it's it's still there um what the future will bring when it comes to our contributor agreements we'll see um, I'm always on the quest to simplify things and make things easier for contributors. Um, but you know, yes, <clears throat> there is, there is, uh, there are limitations of how much, how far you can push it. So, so we had another interesting topic there next to CLA. So, so you spoke about patents and, and you, how you work around patents. I, I guess it's about not tripping over patents, or what's what's the challenge you're trying to solve? I mean, we're not we're not super concerned about patents. So we're we're we've been a member of OIN for of Open Invention Network for quite a bit uh, quite a bit uh, already. Um, so the only what what we're looking what i'm looking for is whether we can you know is whether there's another scheme that would complement it and so far it seems because it does like oin only covers the what falls under the linux definition and it also does that as long as it's in there right um so we're thinking of looking into other options to expand our coverage um so right now it seems like right now we're talking with uh, lotnet which is more of a um, um anti troll uh scheme where you know all the members as, as soon as they they keep the patents but um and the patent rights but as soon as if i remember correctly it's been a long time since i read it um, but as soon as you transfer a patent to a non-practicing entity, um, you everybody in the pool automatically, or everybody that's a member of LotNet, automatically gets a uh, a patent license to that patent. Um, so protecting you from the potential troll, right? So I think that's what. Uh, the next step will be for us as to join that as well. Um, we're not, we're not, we're we're still, you know, looking into it. Um, but um, that might be that might be an interesting thing to for people to look into as well. There was another similar um, network to Lotnet, um, which I think was more favorable, uh, which was which had some favorable coverage by financial 
newspapers, but um, I think that one pretty much putered out. I think it didn't get any traction in the end. I mean, it had some big names initially, but I think like then it kind of just stopped. So I think like LotNet is OIN plus LotNet sounds like a good combination to me right now. So it's, it's basically about protecting yourself around about the risk of, of software patents by by pooling up in in strategic groups. Yeah, the, that plus I mean when when you scan when you scan source code sometimes you find interesting things. So recently I scanned I had to scan Image Magic and uh, and Ghost Script. Mm -hmm. I won't spoil anything. You guys have fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. But it's, it's always uh, it's it's fun to talk with other people who who do checkups. So there are some favorite packages everyone has. I certainly have mine. Yeah, Zlib is Zlib is up there as well. It's also included, I think, in 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 the package that I looked the, the in the Ghost script package that I looked. It had a few Zlib files, and it notoriously had the Che Guevara Zlib header. Hmm. Have you found that one yet? Uh, I've heard about it, uh, uh, but ah, uh, oh, let's it's it's not a show about me, so. <laughs> <laughs> The um, so on that like scanning and 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 seeing strange stuff, uh, you and I have like similar jobs, um, uh, but I'm not a lawyer. Uh, but what is the most? And I'm not a coder, so that's that, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the most common question you get from uh, your developer colleagues? Um, I mean, I assembled an FAQ and a very, very, very long uh, licensing policy. So I created it in a in a way that it's you know kind of like follow your adventure kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So you have like a table of pre-approved licenses uh, for code, pre-approved licenses for 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 fonts, pre-approved licenses for uh, for other content um, and then also, you know, not allowed licenses and licenses where you should totally ask legal for, uh, for, for approval on every specific use case. Um, and then you click through those and you get like short summaries and what you need to do to fulfill the obligations. Um, so I get less of them now, and there's an FAQ I, I have internal as well. Um, it took me like a, two years to set up that. Uh, but like I would say what's interesting is like I think in the company I get different questions from engineers than I did when I was still working for FSFE from you know community questions. Mm -hmm. um, so... Like in in as I said, I mean, in a company you have like you have this you know more or less rigid structure, so you kind of know who's responsible for what. So typically, what happens is I just get a ticket and it says, "Okay, we want to use component X in product Y. Can we do that?" And um, you know. That's that's the most common question I get nowadays. Mm. Um, whereas with um, with the community, you got like some really interesting questions, like on a more of a you know a higher level, uh, like a more abstract level uh, questions. Like um, my favorite, my favorite weird one was. That if I don't put any li license in there, there's no copyright attached. Eh? Right? I mean, then it's public domain. Mm. Like, oh god, no! Mm. It's the other way around. It's the other way around. Abort! <laughs> abort! <laughs> but um, ah, what are more abstract questions that I get from the from internally? Um, Copying code I mean, from Stack Overflow. Oh Christ! Yeah, there was one question like that. Yeah, I'm not gonna share my answer publicly. <laughs> I there. I also. I also deny getting this question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, uh, this we're running out of time. So, 
a, a final question. Rumors are saying that you've been having s- Swedish uh, uh, strumming. Oh god, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if, as an explanation, what do you call that? It's um, herring that you instead, ferment. Yeah, instead of yeah. pickling it, you ferment it. Yeah, it gives a bit, a bit more bite. <laughs> yeah. It's not that no bad. comments. <laughs> okay. I mean, I thought it's gonna be worse. I mean, the smell mm. is awful, and the the bile yeah, the in smell there is, is all the, the bile is the problematic part. But the fish itself is not that bad. Okay. I mean, I I, I never eat it. I, I I wrote a blog post about it. I think that's how you found out about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I do I, prepare actually. I don't know. Uh, you stalk. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I did. I did. I actually didn't find it. That I, the, the biggest problem was getting it on the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> so the oh, imagine that one exploding. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So the the the, the, my, the luck I had was that I I actually had to actually had, you know to smuggling it back home was the big challenge uh, from Malmo. Um, so what I did, I had to run through like three different counters to get it cleared by several people on the, on the airport. Um, and then eventually they said, okay, so if the airline is going to be okay with having it on board and we know that many airlines don't, but if the airline is going to be okay, we're okay with shipping it to them. (laughs) Um, I said, okay. Um, so we went to the counter and I flew with, you know, by then it still existed. So now it's defunct, uh, Adria Airways. So the Slovenian national carrier, um, and, um, you know, the lady behind the counter was Swedish, right. But she was like responsible for the many other small, um, uh, companies. And she said, yeah, I mean, Adria doesn't know this thing exists. There's no rules against it. So <laughs> so go for it. It's like okay, <laughs> and if it's gonna explode, you're gonna notice. It's like, okay, <laughs> but it's it's one of them things. I've had uh, some strange dishes around the world uh, where it's like things you eat because you have to. You probably found some fermented herring and you had to eat it, and all of a sudden the tourist office in some country decide that this is all of a sudden a delicacy yeah but it's yeah. not i think i had rotten shark in iceland and i i can honestly say it's it wasn't good i i heard about that one yeah i heard about that one i i, I think that's one i'm actually more afraid of than surströmming i think the rotten shark sounds really bad but so it's far like so- eating ink <laughs> sorry horrible it was yeah. like eating ink yeah so so far the my the worst you know the worst one I had so far was Korean bloodwurst. Mhm. Uh because we we have bloodwurst in Slovenia it's like you know you put it into intestine and there's like pig's blood with mixed with rice or um sometimes we use um barley uh-huh. barley uh-huh. or or even um buckwheat. Um, and you know, major ram and spices and stuff like that. It's 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 a nice thing, right? Mm. Um, so it's closer to the UK black pudding ish, like kind of like that. What we do in Slovenia, but and for some reason, what they do in and we and we bake them. So you know, you get a crust, and it's like mm. like you know, it, it's not chewy, it's crunchy on the outside. Um, but for some reason, what they do in Korea is they boil them or steam them. I think they steam them. And they even fill, fill them, instead of with rice, they fill them with really, really thick, like, you know, one centimeter thick square no- rice noodles. Um, and they're still intestines, so, but, you know, it's steamed, so it's chewy as hell. <laughs> mm. Oh, God. <laughs> And I was oh. like, I like blood sausage, but that was like, oh my god, this is not going anywhere. And then I had a French colleague of mine who said he was in Korea as well, and apparently I was at a posh restaurant. 
because sometimes they don't clean the thing so thoroughly. <laughs> <laughs> Should we leave it hanging there? <laughs> let's, that was okay. the end of the episode. Right, let's leave it at that. <laughs> Oh, was, God. I think we should end the entire <laughs> session here. It was great having you on the cut, show. Cut, 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 cut. <laughs> <laughs> Abandon the ship. Abandon the ship. <laughs> Thank you for, for uh, joining. And, uh, yeah, we hope you catch up so that you finally get to hear your own episode. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks, thanks for, for being having here. me. And uh, I, ho- I hope at some point I, I managed to join you guys in person as well. I mean, Foss North was on my to-do list for quite some time but it just never happened <laughs>